Okay, hello, we will give it about another minute and then we'll get started. Okay, double checking. Uh, is my uh, microphone working? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I apologize about the um, noise in the background. I have a desktop that's crunching some some things. Um, cool. So I will share the agenda out, and we'll, we will get started. Great, so welcome to the next uh, Network Service Mesh uh, meeting. And so we have uh, this particular meeting, which occurs every 8 a.m. Pacific time uh, on every Tuesday. So if you could please add yourself to the, um, to the agenda, that'd be fantastic. And so I'll see if I can See, I don't make it easy to find uh, the chat while you're while you're working. So, so if you could add yourself there, that'd be fantastic. And with that, let's go and get started. So we also we also have a uh, a meeting every other week uh, that is Asia friendly. Uh, it is currently set for. Uh, according to my calendar, 1 a.m. every other week before the NSM meeting, uh, 1 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. And I believe we had one today. Uh, um, actually, we were only three people on the meeting, and we and, uh, we are people that joined this evening too, so we decided to drop it from today. Okay, fair enough. And so we we also participate in the telecom user group, which occurs every first Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific and every third Monday at 3 a.m. Pacific. The next one will be this coming Monday. The um, We also participate in the CNCF SIG network, which occurs every first and third Thursday of the month. Um, the based on the calendar, that is this Thursday. We, um, the uh, link to access the calendar and the Zoom are in the agenda. We have a host of things that have been postponed and canceled due to, uh, due, due to COVID-19. Um, Good news is, though, uh, KubeCon has finally had some dates set. So if you were not aware of the new dates, these are the new proposed dates, August 13th through 16th. A recommendation from the CNCF, though, is that any travel that you book, uh, make sure that it's refundable in case they need to turn it into a virtual event, because we do not know what's going to happen in the next um, uh, within the next several months. Um, that being said, we do have a call for paper list uh, for things that have uh, that were uh, added uh, 
and for things that were the things that were submitted. Uh, not everything that is on this list will have made it in, but it is still useful for people where if there's a topic you're interested in, yeah, even if it didn't make it in, I'm pretty sure you could reach out to the person and have a conversation. We also have uh, NSMCon, which has been set now for August 13th. And so uh, we we have extended out the time for organizations to sponsor as well, and we'll start uh, asking uh, asking around more when um, uh, when we hit the the lower end of the COVID nineteen crisis. And so the schedule the schedules are currently posted, um, and so you can go see what the schedule is. And we also are. We also will have a postponed version of ONES North America, which I believe they said was going to be around September or October. Uh, and couple, and it's relatively close to ONES Europe. So just be aware that there's some that they're going to be very close together, uh, assuming that they run it. And uh, Cloud Native uh, CNCF, uh, sorry, KubeCon and Cloud NativeCon China has been canceled. Uh, the one in November in North America is uh, still on. The call for paper opens in a few weeks, so we will announce those and remind people to have their papers ready. A um, little short note about Ed. Uh, so uh, Ed is uh, Ed has been pulled into a Cisco. It has been pulled into a Cisco related meeting uh, that he wasn't able to avoid. Uh, just uh, just so people know, he's still very strongly committed to uh, to working with us. It's just unfortunate timing with uh, uh, with the interesting set of events that have been going on recently. So uh, he should be back next week, barring uh, any other and uh, any other major things that uh, pop up between now and then. Um, we also. Hmm. So we also have a social media community team. Do we have Ashley on? Yes, hi everybody. So the last week, as far as social media updates go, it's been another slow week, again, considering what's going on in the world at the moment. So as far as Twitter goes, we've gained two followers. We've followed an additional four accounts and we have had a total of 13 tweets and retweets. Amongst those, some of the posts have included um, the postponement update for KubeCon Cloud Native Con happening now in August, sent out call reminders for the meetings that have happened and will be happening this week, as well as all CNCF weekly webinars. Um, let's see, there's also a CNF testbed call, which is happening next week, Monday, April, April 6th. So that's been promoted as far as Linux Foundation. I've got some tweets out there regarding some online training courses and certifications that are currently discounted at the moment, um, as well as promoted a mentor sponsorship, uh, a mentor program that uh, they will be running. Then just general retweets um, from VMware Open Source related to containers, as well as some um, container blogs from Cisco. As far as LinkedIn goes, we have gained an additional four followers and we continue to promote the same original content that we do tweet on Twitter. And the plan moving forward will be to continue retweets, um, contribute a podcast, as well as now getting back to promoting NSMCon, KubeCon, sponsorship, the prospectus, um, and just trying to get the word out there for that coming up in the summer. So that's it on the social media end of things for this week. Fantastic, thank you very much. And so, yeah, so right now we have our uh, our heads down and we're uh, working to produce some uh, some extra uh, work so we can have a, a stronger release for the next KubeCon. And so, as we are closer to those uh, to those milestones, we will discuss uh, what's going on and and uh, try to uh, try to work out how we want to um, how we, how we want to pitch this as we as we start to uh, to approach uh, as we approach KubeCon. 
Um, but thank you very much for um, for the links that you that you sent and. Uh, so before before we get started, is there anything anyone else wants to put on the agenda? So we we do have the uh, the operator live now. Uh, recommend people go off and and try it and. Uh, but it is, if, if there's anything anyone wants to discuss, uh, definitely feel free to bring it up. Um, with that, I have a presentation. Sorry, I've got a little bit of a cough that I've had for the past several weeks. Um, I have a presentation on Cloud Native Zero Trust that I've been working on. And so what I would like to do is I'd like to share it and get a little bit of feedback from this, uh, from this group. And so it's still a work in progress, but it's uh, it's at a point now where I can uh, where I can share it and um, and it it should start to be a useful a useful deck. So cool. So let's go ahead and get started on this. So so we start with cloud native zero trust as the as the topic, and so. Uh, we, so we start with the definition of perimeter defense. Uh, so a perimeter defense is an untrusted client is connecting to a trusted server through a firewall or through a trusted system. So in other words, you have a perimeter on the, the, on the, on the right side and you're defending things using a firewall or other techniques, uh, so net network, address, network address translation, load balancers, and so on, but generally in the shape of a firewall with something that is uh, that is untrusted. Uh, there are different forms of uh, perimeter defense that are more advanced. So one example is the creation of a DMZ. And so in a DMZ, you have the internet, goes through a firewall up to a private network that has been sectioned off from both the internet and your internal network. And then the connection goes through another firewall to and from the corp network. Um, the, uh, there are no direct connections between the internet and the to to the corp network. Uh, although in some scenarios, or many most scenarios now, I su assume there may be connections that go in the opposite direction, possibly to the DMZ. There are several variations of this. Uh, one variation is you have a single firewall that then creates a DMZ for you, and uh, also firewalls off the corp the corporate network, and still provides you with the internet. So it's still this particular one, but instead of two devices defending you, it's one device that has uh, that has uh, three uh, access to three networks. Um, so Kubernetes is a variation of perimeter defense in the, in the way that it's typically implemented. You have a client which which goes through an ingress, which acts as your as acts as a uh, L2, L3, L4 firewall to a degree, um, but it doesn't have any advanced features in terms of, at least most usually it doesn't have any advanced features, but you can add things in with the with ingress, uh, with the ingress controller and control access to your service in a pod. There, another uh, variation, and I'll fill this out. Uh, another variation of this is a, oops, is uh, you have uh, two perimeters that you're trying to defend against and you create a tunnel and that tunnel goes through an untrusted network such as the internet. And however, the, the, the details matter. And so from a details uh, side, we wanna make sure that we match our IP addresses properly or that we put in the proper network address translations in these areas. We also uh, have to specify access control list in terms of like what's allowed to connect to what in both sides. So this side has outbound rules of a system connecting from here to here. So 
what ends up happening though when you want to allow a specific uh, set of address a specific address to connect but not another so your access control has become much more detailed or if you want to connect uh, to more than one service that is in the other control in the other trust zone. So again, your access control list start to, to grow larger. Simultaneously on the opposite side, how do you establish trust in the in the client? The general answer at this level is uh, is we're still dealing in IP something that's IP based. And so in this IP based version, we are uh, we're basically saying we're gonna whitelist specific addresses. Um, how do you expose other services? And so uh, there's multiple ways to do this. It's it's not uncommon to expose the IP address directly out on many systems or to stick some type of an application gateway in between. So that way that this could be a, you could have an F5 gateway or something similar, uh, Nginx or some other similar thing that, uh, that sits in the middle. And so, there's also questions on how do you differentiate between multiple nodes in terms like service A and service uh, and service B if you have multiple ser uh, services where uh, where you need to, to uh, horizontally scale or or, sh or shut them down. And finally, how do you populate or rotate your certificates into other trust zones? Uh, and th this one we'll get into more in a while, but. Uh, this particular this particular one is uh, is set based upon like this is a uh, you can see think of this as a trust zone or a trust domain and the same with this one it, it's a, a zone of trust. Um, one potential answer on this is to set up VPNs so that you can connect them together and uh, expose out the the routes. Uh, and as you add more systems, you can create a mesh between the different VPNs themselves, but you have to be very careful because these IP addresses uh, that you have to, you have to do some form of IPAM or some form of network address translation with a private network in the VPNs in order to minimize the, uh, the potential conflicts. Uh, a little aside, be very careful with, with L2 VPNs. Uh, L2 VPNs end up, uh, you end up having to uh, share your uh, your uh, ARP tables around and you have to synchronize them together across multiple systems in order to perform ARP caching in an efficient way. Um, and these all come because literally layer two is generally not routable. Uh, these problems tend to go away when you use layer three because layer three is, is routable. Uh, in the more advanced side of this, you end up with, uh, with uh, BGP sharing around uh, ARP tables uh, using something like eVPN. Um, so when you start to hook up multiple subnets together and you start to, to combine them, then what ends up happening is you have to deconflict them. And so in two networks, you only have to deconflict for one connection. For three networks, three connections, six and so on. So the more you add in, the more subnets you have to to deconflict, and so you can model them based upon this formula. But and and so what you have to be careful with is uh, is in addition to the to reducing the conflicts, uh, how do you also manage these? Who gets to type up these configs, or how do you how do you uh, integrate them together? Um, this will become particularly difficult once we start to see more edge cases appear. So with edge cases, think of them like uh, you may have uh, a system where your on-premise is has a, is owned by by your company. The edge might be a, a, a system that's owned by an ISP, or it could be Equinix or some other system, and then you then connect into something like Amazon, which may be your system, or it could be a partner's. And so that means you then have to synchronize with all of your potential partners uh, in order in working out these uh, these subnets. And so you also have to be a bit careful because what happens if you don't plan appropriately for your growth, which is very easy to do. Um, and you often see things using, uh, using uh, NAT in terms of trying to reduce the complexity on this, which helps, but then you end up with a lot of complexity in managing the the NAT system. And for many people, uh, I know this is not the only answer, 
Uh, but when things start to break, you, you often see a lot of a lot of manual work going into managing the firewalls or managing the uh, the edge perimeters, and so this becomes a, a manual process, and people end, you end up having to keep track of of all of the details in your in your system in order to uh, in order to keep things uh, scaling. So back to the original question, how does this end up improving security? Because we end up with runaway complexity. A lot of, conf a, a lot of, uh, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, remove this one. We also end up with uh, fragile configurations, potentially fragile configurations. Uh, SDNs can help here, but they, there's still a lot of things to, to manage and even more so when you bring in multiple companies. Uh, and then trying to gain observability and debugging these systems can be, in practice, very uh, very difficult. And finally, the the main problem with it, though, when we talk about security, is you're defending with the assumption that the attacker is uh, is attacking from the uh, from the ins that the attacker is coming from the from the outside. So in other words, our infrastructure is defending using 11th century techniques. Your attackers will come from out here and you're defending your, this, the thing that you want to defend in here. Uh, but the problem though is what if your attack actually starts from, from, from in here or someone is already, you have a, a malicious actor that has already gained access to the inside. And so that's where perimeter defense starts to, to fall down. So we want to move from perimeter defense to a, to a zero trust environment where we we're no longer relying on the trusted, trusted networks with a trusted tunnel between them. Instead, we're relying on untrusted networks. They can still be private. We're not saying that the, the private networks go away, but rather uh, they become more like an more like an onion in this scenario. The multiple layers of defense, but uh, your workloads will attest each other's uh, workload, and you establish or rather verify each other's identity, and they will then establish a secure connection between them. And uh, an attacker who is who is trying to uh, to connect with one of these attested workloads, even if they're in the untrusted network. Uh, it does not gain access to any of the uh, systems, even if they spoof the IP address. So the question is, how do we achieve this? So we start by establishing a trust domain. So at the top of each trust domain is a CA. Uh, and so think of a trust domain like, like an organization, like uh, your, your organization may, may manage a, a CA that gets rotated over time. You then attest the workloads. So there may be other things you attest in between, such as a sub-organization, a cluster, a node, or so on. Uh, but at the end of, the, at the very bottom, you want to attest the uh, the workloads. So the application gateway receives an identity in this scenario, and the API gateway receives a uh, an identity. You want to establish policy and how these things connect with each other. So this is one that I that I got from Spiffy. So I'll make sure to to cite this. Um, but in this scenario, we're pulling the spit the source Spiffy ID. So you see this this is very declarative. You're saying what path do I want to allow? I want to allow pet slash owner using the get using the get request, and the ID must match. Um, must match the spiffy domain test slash front end API for, for its identity. How do we get that ID? And we specify that by saying one of the requiters has a X forwarded client certificate where we were able to extract that information out and, uh, and verify it. So we were able to, uh, this example doesn't show it, but uh, we're able to, we're also able to validate the certificate that's passed through. So this, so before we grab the client ID, we would validate the certificate to make sure that it's uh, that it's a valid certificate that is known by by our infrastructure. And if it is, and then we and it's and it respects these this contract, and then we allow the connection through. And so we can establish this type of API uh, in a much more detailed way as well. So if there's a JWT, 
we can also include information about the JWT in order to uh, in the, from the token and pull that information to also scope the, the path even further. And I guess it would be a good idea to, to put an example towards that as well. So uh, tr establishing trust between organizations. So if you have multiple CAs, or organization organ one and organization two, you don't have to send all the certificates that have been generated. You only have to send the, the two CAs or you only have to share the CA information with each other. And if you shared the CA information with uh, across both sides, that means organization one can attest organization two workloads and organization two can attest organization one workloads. So once you've established the trust between organizations, then in your spiffy IDs that you are uh, that you're setting up in this one, you say the destination spiffy ID is uh, is the storage API. And this one you're saying you are allowing connections from, uh, and you can set your policy to allow things from this specific uh, from this specific workload. So in this scenario, we can identify even if we even if we create the storage API, even if this ends up horizontally scaling um, up or down, uh, when we hit a storage API, we know that we're hitting something as long as the organization attests it properly, uh, that, uh, that we're hitting the right workload, regardless of, uh, of how many that are, that are there. So we end up translating this pattern to NSM. In the pattern, uh, every workload in this scenario with every pod has its, uh, has its identity. And it could also have its associated policy that gets enforced through the NSM. The network service endpoint itself uh, has its identity and, uh, and it can have policy about, uh, we can enforce policy about what uh, is allowed to connect to it. We also can wire in the intrusion detection system in this scenario. So this is uh, the Sarah's use case that, um, that we tend to use. And so, uh, so each of these has an identity in the uh, in the network uh, in the management layer. So these systems here don't have that identity uh, themselves, but rather we're driving the identity through here. And so uh, once we establish the chain and we are comfortable with the uh, with the identities and the policy here, one key point with NSM is uh, it's being developed so that you can check the chain. Of a whole uh, of a whole uh, of the whole chain itself, so you can check policy that's not just between like the policy for this connection. You can say what is the policy for the entire chain itself, and make sure that it follows a uh, an acceptable uh, an acceptable path. And when these these things get uh, connected, they get connected based upon the uh, the settings that are here after they've been validated properly. Now, uh, a key to this though is the, as an operator, you have to be uh, mindful that just because this is encrypted and uh, the management is uh, is uh, is set up to verify each other's identity, that doesn't mean that this here necessarily is. And so you have to make sure that the primitives that you expose out at the lower levels. Uh, also respect the privacy that you that you need, and so there. So this a really good example is between like the firewall and the intrusion detection system. You don't want there to be an attacker here. But what's good in this scenario is uh, NSM has the uh, has the uh, capability to pass context forward and back. So if if you want to set up, uh, let's say like we're we're building WireGuard as a support into NSM as an example. So if you want these things to be WireGuard as an example then that means that we can pass the parameters and synchronize them at this level. So then they get injected into these systems and then your link becomes secure. So part of this uh, path is making sure that if it's important for the data path to be secure, then you negotiate those parameters at the top so that they can get injected into the, into the tunnels themselves. Uh, so in a nutshell, that is uh, what I wanted to show off. And I put it on the links as to, uh, as to where people can learn more about the individual technologies. So uh, I definitely found a couple holes that I need to solve for uh, in giving the presentation out, but I wanted to ask for feedback on, on what people uh, thought and what, what, can I, what can I improve on this?
Cool, I'm not uh, hearing anything. So either people are on mute or uh, if you're not comfortable talking in front of the group uh, as well, you know, definitely feel free to ping me uh, uh, to ping me in Slack directly, and I'll also um, uh, I'll also take uh, responses to there as well. Um, I'm going to continue working on this particular document. This is something that I that I was going to to give at a at a meetup here in the San Francisco Bay Area on in the Go San Francisco. So I want to make sure that this presentation is ready to go for when they when they resume. And it is also going to become the uh, the basis for other uh, for other talks that I'm giving as well. Uh, and so another thing to to also get, that I would like to suggest on on this is uh, also ways to simplify it. So not just what is missing, but ways to simplify it. Um, and so with that, I don't have anything else and let's double check the agenda. Yeah, so there's still nothing nothing else on the agenda. Is there anything that anyone would like to ask before we finish? Oh, there's nothing else. Then we'll uh, give you back around 25 minutes of your time and uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Testa micken. Det hörs inte. <laughs> det funkar jättebra. Tarik hör inte heller. Tarik prata. Jag har, jag, har ja. jag har tagit över hela mötet. Ja, jag har gjort det i våra möten faktiskt. Vad roligt. Vill du också prata i något siffror? Kan du berätta Johan vad du har gjort nu då? Nu kör, nu kör vi en och någonting. Uh. Ja, men jag höll ju på mycket med det som jag beskrev, att om man skulle kunna tjäna ihop allting. Ja, har du fått det funka? Ja, äh, det såg faktiskt ut så. Vad roligt! Vad har du på det? Vad kör du på det? Ja, nu hörs det knappt alls. Kör du körn eller får du det? Ja, exakt. Hörs det dåligt när jag pratar? Ja, det hördes bra nyss, men nu hörs det mindre igen. Nu också? Ja, det låter som att du sitter typ på andra sidan av väggen eller något. Jag gör som Tarek, jag går omkring här hemma. Ja. Nej. Vad är det Micke på den här datorn? Har du fått någon ny dator en gång? Ja. Ja, men nu, du har Körner dataplan, har du det? Ja, exakt. Och så kör du både VLAN och VXLAN och allt möjligt som utgående länkar, eller? Ja, nu blir det det. Mm. Uh, som det jag testade nu var... Det uh, blir ett VLAN in till den här andra NSN ja. och sen så blir det ett gäng VXLAN ut till klienterna som Just sitter på det. den. Men de blir ju alltså själv då? Uh, ja, bara att uh, kernel forwarden ska funka men, när man har det. Men blir det ett VLAN till NSN? Borde det inte bli VXLAN mellan, all, mellan alla andra och, och, vi, och VLAN bara ut? Jo, men VLAN är ut. Alltså det blir ju ingenting ja, från den där första NSN. Nej. Nej, just det. Har rätt. Utan den andra. Vad, vad som händer när du gör så att du får en NSC som har en massa VLAN ut och så har du en VXLAN in mot klienten. Ja, exakt. Så det som vi ritade för typ ett halvår sedan på tavlan har du brukat göra så. Det är skitbra. Ja, ungefär. Ja. Uh. Vi kanske ska presentera. Jag vet inte, både Roshimi och Tarik tycker att vi ska prata med, men när inte Ebbe där är det ju meningslöst att göra någonting utan Ebbe. Ja, det kanske är bra att han är med. Ja, jag måste ju det är tråkigt. Ja, det funkar i alla fall. Nu ska jag ringa till Lori och säga att du har att du har duktig och att, att du kan kan, kan du dema det här på nästa han var coolt. Kan du dema det där med alltså när vi har när vi har ett eh,
En NSC, och så kallar man för en NSC med inline data plane och en och en NSC med externt som gör att man kommer ut. Så det är skitbra. Kan du dela det på någon dag? Uh, det var typ om jag inte ens testat det i 100 procent än, det var det klart för typ en halvtimme sedan. Ja, två veckor då? Ja, ja definitivt. Ja, skitbra. Uh. Kalmar, det var faktiskt sen att inte dog folk i helgen, Kalmar. Ja, oj. Ja, ja nu måste jag ringa till Olof, vi får att Och det är så bra, Johan. Ja, men äh, Tarik är också kvar. Ja, Tarik är kvar, han säger ingenting. Du måste prata, Tarik. Hej, Tarik. Anmjut ska man göra, Tarik. Det låter en massa i bakgrunden, hör du? Hör du bruset här, eller? För nu kör jag med micken, en annan mic. Nej, jag kör en massa människor som babblar. Men det är inte här. Skumt. Men du ser ditt bruset, det låter ju fan som hela Johan sitter och pratar. <laughs> Vänta, om jag drar upp micken här, om du hörs mer kanske. Ja. Hörs du mer? Vad jävlar vad det vatten som det vatten är. <laughs> vad är det skillnad? Är det fel på den här micken? Vad sa du? Var det, var det något fel på den här micken? Som du, det var lite vart brus bara. Nej, jag drog upp äh, känsligheten massa. Jaha, ja, nej det var bara brusare. Men låter min mic dåligt nu? Måste jag sitta och skrika i datorn? Hur ska jag sitta och prata? Ja, men nu låter det bra. Ja, ja. ja. Tarik. Tarik har pratat jätte mycket och vi hör inte det. Ja, men... Ja, vi hörs. Mm, okay. Hej.